Hi guys. Hey guys. Um, my name is Jonathan Rogers. Um, as he was saying, I'm one of the founders of Grinding Gear Games. Um, so uh, let me just get down here so I can see the um, my notes. Um, so yeah, well basically we're a, um, a game development studio that's based out in Henderson. Um, we have about 160 people, um, something like that these days. Um, and one of the things that surprises a lot of people who um, hear about our studio is that we make our own engine. Um, so, I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, there's lots of off good off-the-shelf engines. Why are you not using Unity? Why are you not using Unreal? That kind of thing. Um, and hang on a second. I'm just going to full screen that browser because I just can't live with it. Um, hang on a second. I've just got to do it. Um, there we go. That's better. <laughs> um, so, um, as I said, um, people are surprised we're on an engine because there are lots of great ones out there. And if you go online, you're going to find a lot of people talking like this, right? You know, like, oh, yeah, you know, why you, you shouldn't make your own engine. Um, it's terrible. Like, it's going to take you forever. You're going to do all this different, uh, you know, it's going to take you forever to never release anything. Um, it's kind of like one of those pieces of advice to, uh, to noobs um, that uh, you see all the time. And um, to be honest, they, they could quite easily be right. I mean, you know, like it worked out well for us, but, uh, you know, who's to say that uh, we actually know what the hell we're talking about? Um, but personally, I actually think writing uh, your own engine is actually really awesome. Um, and you should do it too, and I would definitely do it again um, if I was starting again today. So, um, as I said, yeah, people say all these things um, about how it's terrible, um, but then on the other hand, um, you know, we, we managed to make this, so uh, we're doing something okay. So, yeah. Okay, so um, that's Path of Exile 2, which we currently have in development. Um, so hopefully you agree that we're doing something okay with our own engine. Um, and basically what I'd like to do today is just run you guys through um, some of the features that we have and the tooling that we have and so on. Um, uh, and then so you can sort of see like what we're working with with our own engine. Um, so probably the first thing that jumps out um, for most people when it comes to um, any engine is like how does the lighting work? It's kind of like one of the most uh, pretty things. Um, and um, uh, modern scenes and games really do require a lot of lights, um, especially for an effective game like PoE. Um, I'm pretty sure this is an old version of the slide, so I don't actually have the videos that I expected to have, but that's okay, we'll just continue on going. Um, so uh, Path of Exile uses um, what's called a Ford Plus uh, rendering engine. And um, back when we started, um, uh, we used um, uh, what's called a, a forward rendering, which is just basically the sort of standard technique for rendering um, that all games tended to use in the past. Um, and basically it just means that you're rendering an object with all its materials and lighting in one go, um, and there's kind of no like special tricks, it's just like, you know, get a shader, render some things. Uh, um, and it's really simple, um, but there's various limitations. Like you can only, and in our case, we only had four lights per draw call, um, and uh, the method for calculating which lights affect which draw calls was kind of crappy. Um, so we basically wouldn't be able to do something like this test right here where we were firing tons of fireballs all with lights on them. Um, so even um, a decade ago, it was pretty much standard practice and um, all of the like, really modern high-end engines to use what's called deferred uh, shading. And basically the idea with deferred shading is that you um, render the scene once to a uh, sort of intermediate buffer where you just render the um, things like the colors and normal maps and things like that to an um, intermediate buffer. Um, and then you use, do a second pass where you render all the lights, um, where you use that information to um, construct the scene. 
And uh, that lets you have lots of lights like this. Um, but it's kind of annoying because um, it's super complicated to implement. Um, I mean, not so much like directly, but there's just tons of like trade-offs that you need to make all the time. Like you can't uh, render um, any um, alpha blended geometry with this, so you can't have like effects like this fireball right here. Um, using the same pipelines, you have to have a, a forward pipeline as well. Um, and there's just like all sorts of annoying things to do with material limitations that you can do and stuff like that. So um, basically, uh, we never switched to it, um, and that's good because um, time moved on and um, things improved, and eventually now we're using a thing um, called a forward plus renderer. Um, which is basically where you um, break down the, um, uh, all of the lights into little tiles all over the screen. Um, I did have a video of this, but I think maybe it's not going to be in this version of the slides. No, it isn't. Okay, so um, basically, um, yeah, uh, you break down all of the, um, the lights onto, um, into tiles, um, and then you, can, uh, you work out you know, which, which ones are which. Uh, and then as the, um, you're rendering all of your geometry, you just reference that texture and look it up. So this is basically a long technical explanation, which probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but whatever, I'm the technical director, so I like to talk about technical stuff. Um, so uh, basically this allows us to have lots of lights like in the scene you just saw. Um, and then another thing that's really sort of important for our lighting model um, is that we've got uh, dynamic uh, screen space shadows on all of those lights. So if you see here when I'm firing the light, um, and I'll just play that again and loop it this time, um, uh, you can see that there's uh, dynamic shadows on those lights, and there's actually dynamic shadows on every light. So um, every single light in the game um, has these dynamic shadows, and they're done in, um, in screen space. So uh, basically, um, when you do something in screen space, um, it basically means that um, you can only refer to geometry that is currently on screen. Um, and so for a game like ours, which is top-down like this, um, this is actually really great because uh, most of the occluders that would ever obscure a light are going to be on the screen anyway. Um, so uh, due to that, we're able to come up with a screen space solution for lighting, which very few games would do something like this, and it means we can have a really fast um, uh, algorithm for doing lighting, uh, for shadows I should say, um, on lights um, that makes the game look a lot cooler. Um, and then um, uh, another technique that we use, um, once again, to do with lighting is um, screen space global illumination. Um, so global illumination is a technique that is um, uh, becoming sort of something that's quite common in real-time games, but um, it actually wasn't really common um, uh, until very recently. And um, we actually had this solution in um, 2018, so we're actually kind of ahead of the curve on this one. Um, and once again, because we've got a top-down game, um, we can do a screen space solution for GI. Um, and just to sort of show you what um, that looks like, um, uh, here's a scene with um, global illumination turned off, where I've, I've turned off most of the lights, I'm just firing fireballs. So all you can see there is just the direct lighting, so effectively just the lights that are directly on the fireballs. Um, and if I move to the, um, uh, to the next slide, um, you can see the same scene with me firing... Wait, that is not the next slide. One second. Uh, that's the next slide. <laughs> um, you can see the same scene um, with global illumination turned on. Um, and uh, basically, um, you can see, it's a little bit subtle here, um, but you can see the lights, um, the fireballs have a second bounce that's appearing on the cave walls um, as, you, as you fire the things there. And um, that's actually really important for a lot of scenes. Um, it um, makes the effects come alive in a um, kind of awesome way. And um, unlike most GI solutions that games are using, ours is actually real, real time, not just like kind of pseudo real time like a lot of these other ones are. So every, it's, it's recalculated every frame, and that means that we can actually use it for all of our effects. Um, and so you get um, some pretty nice lighting effects. Um, all right. Um, and then there's just like a million other custom renderer features that we have. Like here's a random one, which is the grass that we have in our game. Um, this is actually made using um, uh, a pre-calculated lookup texture um, where we basically ray trace something with really high quality, create a volume texture um, uh, that's used to represent it. Uh, and then we can render it really fast in real time um, in a scene like this. Um, so yeah, that's some of the fun stuff we're doing. So um, basically, uh, next up, what I'd like to do is um, basically show you um, some of the tooling that we have, because um, you know this is like kind of a lot of what really goes into an engine is the tooling, right? Um, so uh, this stuff is probably going to be, um, you know, maybe boring to some people, but you know, I enjoy it. So um, this tool here um, is called the Asset Viewer, and uh, basically, um, it started out as a tool just for seeing assets as they appear in the game, um, uh, in the um, uh, in a version of the engine that means you didn't actually have to hold, load the whole game. Um, but it kind of morphed into this tool that allows for um, large amounts of uh, editing and stuff as well. Um, so here what I've loaded is an um, um, asset, which is a, a boss monster called the um, Crowbell. Um, he uh, you know, has some physics stuff, you can jiggle him around and sort of see how we'd look um, in the engine. Um, 
And um, I guess um, I just want to show you sort of some of the editors that we have in this tool um, that let you, um, you know, edit some of the elements of this, um, uh, of this asset. Um, so the first one that I'll show is, um, oh, sorry. Uh, wait, what's going on here? Sorry, I'll just keep on not doing it. Okay, here we go, right. So the first one I'm going to show is the um, uh, graph-based material editor. Um, so uh, a lot of engines have um, this kind of thing. Um, we were actually late to the party here, but um, ours is a little bit different in some ways. Um, so what I'm going to do here is just use it to do the kind of typical thing you might do. I'm going to take the albedo color and break it up into all of its four channels, um, add a node to multiply it by a constant, and then attach the two elements. And um, then now I can modify the color. This is the red channel, so I'm just putting it to zero and then putting it to, to two. Um, and then you can see the asset sort of is modified in real time. Um, so that works just like how a lot of other engines would work, um, and that's cool and everything. Um, but one of the things that um, I kind of don't like about that system is that um, it requires editing graphs, which is something that um, a lot of uh, artists don't really understand. Um, so we actually have a uh, system in Path of Exile, which I don't think is that similar to other systems, where you can add multiple graphs. Um, sorry, this is the same video again. Um, here we go. You can add multiple graphs um, to a material, um, and then you can set certain parameters of those graphs um, to be uh, parameters that are um, modifiable um, outside of the graph system. Um, and then you can reuse those graphs across different uh, materials. So for example, someone's already made a thing, a, a graph that just does basic color channel uh, multiplication. So I don't need to do it manually. I can just add that existing graph and then um, just uh, use the parameter editor at the top left there. Um, to modify the individual values of the sliders rather than having to, um, you know, break links and create things with different in a graph. Um, and this is actually pretty good because um, it means that you can have a giant library of um, graphs that do individual little building blocks of things, um, so which we have here. Um, so here's a big library of effects. You can't read them because the resolution is too low, but that's fine. Um, and so, for example, I just added one which um, is called the expand effect, um, which expands the geometry across, along its normal. Um, so you can make like a chubby version of this asset, um, uh, you know, uh, just by doing that. And then if you want to add another effect, while that effect is still there, you can do that. You just, you know, add another one from the list. I'm going to add an um, effect here called um, Muddle UV, which just kind of like modifies the, um, the UV mapping of the uh, monster so that it um, kind of looks funny and just adjusts some of the parameters. I'm not an artist, so I don't really know what the hell I'm doing here. But, um, you know, I can just like modify some random stuff, and that's kind of cool, I guess. Um, and then, so another example of an editor um, that we uh, have is um, animations. So that's kind of important for a game engine. So um, here's the animation list. So um, you can see there um, the, uh, um, you know, like all the different animations for attacks and so on. And um, there's an animation timeline um, that shows the events that designers have added to the timeline. So all those yellow ones there are sound events because there's like a whole bunch of stuff like that going on. Um, so those are kind of annoying, so I'm just going to hide those. And then you can see the, um, uh, the events that are kind of important, I guess, um, to what you're seeing. Um, so uh, you see there, um, I mean, it's a bit hard to read, but there are basically events that people have added to the timeline there um, which trigger gameplay events. Um, so you put an event on there for, like, you know, start of swipe or whatever, and then that is the event that the code or script or whatever is going to hook into to kind of, like, begin doing whatever elements the, are needed for this monster. Um, and then... Uh, you know, an example, example of a sort of an editor and, and along the same lines is um, this is our like melee attack damage pattern editor. Um, so you see on the ground there, there's those two damage shapes. Um, so basically, a designer has set up um, like this is the shape that the damage um, that the you know that these swipes should go in. There's one kind of like cleave sort of attack there, and then one sort of like forward moving attack. Um, and then basically, as the um, if the player's standing in the wrong place, then at the right time, the damage will come in. And, that thing. So that's an example of the kind of custom editor that we have in our thing, which is exactly entirely designed for our game. Um, and, um, you know, it's pretty easy to add to a tool that we have. Um, and then here's another example of a thing. So for example, this is the trail editor. Um, so uh, you can see there's trails when the monster attacks. Um, what I'm going to do is just extend the lifetime of one of them. Um, so you can see there that the lifetime of that trail has been extended to be really long. Um, and then uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see the way that you actually edit them into the properties of the trails. So for example, there's these graphs here. And effectively, you drag the elements on the graphs around uh, to see what effect it has in real time of the, um, of the trail on the screen. Um, so what I've done there is I've changed the, um, the alpha color um, of the trail to have like two humps in it. Um, so now like every time it slashes, there's like two bright flashes, which um, looks ugly, but it's just, you know, just for demonstrative purposes. 
Um, and, you know, I can modify other things, like, you know, here I've made it so the trail sort of drifts sideways. Um, once again, I'm not an artist, so I don't really know how to use these tools very well. Um, but uh, basically, you know, you can use these things to um, modify the properties. And, um, of course, the... <coughs> sorry. The... Uh, Trail um, itself um, has a material which you can then use the material library that we talked about before, like the graph library, to be able to make random modifications to that as well. Um, so, um, <coughs> um, once again, here I'll just add um, from the library, hopefully, that this here, uh, another uh, random effect and uh, modify some of the parameters. And you can see I'm royally screwing this effect up now. Um, but it is modifying, and uh, someone who actually knows how to use this editor will be able to use that to actually make this effect look good rather than terrible. So, um, yeah, um, that's another example of an editor. Uh, and then one, one of the other editors we've got is like particle effects. So this is the um, Velcro's leap attack. And then uh, when he hits the ground, um, I'm just going to open the asset that is spawned at his feet, which is like this sort of like slam attack. So... Um, <coughs> Um, that's an example of a, um, of a thing that uses a bunch of particle systems. Um, so what I'll do is I will um, show you what the uh, editor that looks like. So um, uh, basically what I'm going to start with is um, muting all of the effects. So we can just sort of isolate one of them just so that we can sort of see what we're doing. I'm going to unmute um, the uh, sort of smoke that like billows out um, when he hits the ground. Um, and then just like the other, um, uh, just like the other effect, I'm going to lengthen the lifetime of that thing, um, just so you can sort of see it for a bit longer. And then we can just play around with some of the values, just to you know, um, see what kind of stuff we can do. So uh, this is like, there's lots of parameters up the top left there. You can see, like for example, I believe this one has like rotation locked to velocity. For example, like, and there's all these sort of things that particle systems designers understand. Where um, you know, like here in this case, you want the like the the wave to kind of follow the velocity of the particle. So um, you turn that thing on and various things. You know, I'm going to like just randomly screw around with various values. Um, so you know, basically screwing it up. I guess like making the um, it be a bit brighter. So that's the alpha channel there, making it brighter over its lifetime, so it fades out um, a lot slower. Um, and then maybe, um, I don't know, like, uh, change the scale so that, like, it start like, currently just kind of gets bigger over its lifetime, but we can change the scale so that, like, it goes bigger and then smaller again, um, which kind of screws up the, like, velocity locking thing a little bit, but whatever. Um, yeah, once again, it looks ugly, but it's okay. Um, you know, we're making changes, and you can sort of see, uh, the capabilities that you have. So, um, uh, and then there's, uh, terrain, right? So the game is a tile-based um, game. So um, here I've just got a video of opening up some um, uh, terrain tiles. So this is a um, some river segments. So the game is basically made out of like lots of tiny little tiles just like this um, and then they get strung together by the random label generator to actually generate the area that you see. Um, so um, here's some uh, river tiles as I was saying and uh, one of the things that's sort of important to be able to do um, is to uh, oh, uh, is to sorry, this one last one. There it is. Uh, is to um, be able to edit these things and actually create the metadata that's used by the game engine to do its job. Uh, so one of the first editors I can show you here is like the hull editor. Um, the, the different colors represent different walkability states. So um, green means you can walk there. Um, yellow means you can't walk, but you can have flying things go over it, like projectiles. And red means that um, you can't walk or have projectiles going through it. Uh, and there's also like an editor for things like uh, height, because that's important, obviously, if you can, you know, Play walks around the thing, and there's also like uh, various other modes in there um, for that. Uh, for example, like detecting height automatically based on geometry and so on. Once again, I don't really know how to use these tools very well because I don't use them very much these days. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, as I said, I'm not the best, but um, I can sort of show you some of the capabilities. And um, the other thing that's important is the um, markup with regard to telling the engine um, how these things fit together. Um, so here you can see the, um, that markup. It's a bit hard to read, but those little blue uh, bits there with the text um, basically say that um, there is a river connection here at this location. And basically um, the engine knows that if there's, uh, those locations are lined up on the edges of two tiles, and that means that those tiles can fit together and they will tile correctly because the artist set them up that way. Um, there's also various other green boxes that to do with um, ground materials, which is another whole topic, but um, the main one I wanted to show you was just the, um, uh, the metadata for the um, edges. Um, because that comes important uh, later when we're talking about random level generation, uh, which I guess um, I'll talk about now. 
So um, this is another tool we have, um, the Room Editor. Um, I guess this one is kind of closest to the type of thing you might imagine seeing in another engine like Unity or Unreal, um, since it's kind of got like a scene with like a bunch of stuff you can place. Um, so I'm just going to open up a bunch of um, rooms here. But effectively in Path of Exile, a, um, a room is just a higher level structure um, that the random level generator can use, um, made out of tiles that the artist put together. Um, so the random level generator can use um, individual um, tiles to construct levels, but um, a lot of the time you want to create these higher level structures to actually, you know, like, for, like rooms in a dungeon, um, because that actually is what makes the game feel like an artist made it. Um, and then this tool lets you do that, and also you can see a preview there of a character running around, which is actually not a real, the real thing of the game, it's just so you can see the scale um, for when you're editing. Um, and I just, I'll just quickly show you um, what it looks like to edit a room. Um, so we have uh, these various palettes, so like tile sets of tiles, and so you select from that, and then you place it down in the room, and then you can, like, uh, there's this little thing here to shortcut to just extend um, a uh, thing with the existing uh, type. Uh, placing down a few um, arbitrary walls and so on. Um, and then uh, I guess what I'll do is find, like, uh, maybe like a feature tile. Um, so features are just, like, things that aren't connected to anything. They're just, like, kind of an object. So there's, like, a random, like, more, sorry, like, what do you call it? Sarcophagus or something. Uh, and maybe find some other random ones or get some fill tiles actually and just sort of fill the fill the level in. And uh, once again, I'm not an artist, so I don't, you know, know how to use this tool well. Uh, there's also doodads as well as tiles, so those are just things that are just meshes that you can just place around that have um, uh, you know that don't uh, make up the world, but they do kind of just add something you know good looks to it, I guess. Um, I'm just kind of here, just trying to kind of find like something that's vaguely um, in line with the art, the tile art I was using, and kind of unsuccessfully find some. Of like a bookshelf, um, and uh, you know you can do all the things that you would expect um, once again in a sort of editor like this. You know, you rotate the thing around and so on, uh, place different objects, and yeah, that's basically how it works. So um, one thing that I should note is that um, unlike a normal editor, like when you place things in this um, editor, um, you're not really placing uh, like an exact asset. You're kind of placing like the metadata for that asset, and what I mean by that is is that like you're placing a, the, a thing which says, like, there is a wall that goes from here to here. You're not really placing a, the exact, like, asset by file name. And that means that if you randomly regenerate the room, you get, like, slightly different results, um, which is kind of the first, one of, the, one of the levels of random generation, so you can see the room changes a bit. Um, it can get a lot more extreme than this because um, you can make, like, large sets of different assets that have the same metadata, um, which means that they can all replace each other, and that sort of leads to one of the areas that you get with um, randomness in the levels. Although it's just kind of minor, I suppose, relative to uh, the higher level structures. Um, and then I guess the next tool that I'll show you is, uh, if I can just change, where's the, uh, this is my spot, here it is. Uh, one of the next tools that I'll show you um, is our, like, uh, speaking of that, is our um, level uh, preview tool. Uh, so basically, um, this thing here just lets you see an entire level, um, uh, having generated it. So um, you, uh, I'm here I'm clicking regenerate a couple of times, just you can see a couple of different variations. Um, this level is actually quite constrained. Um, which basically means that the random generator is not free to do too much. Um, it's picking different rooms, but the overall path is actually relatively um, uh, similar. And um, that's because uh, earlier on in the game, we tend to reduce the amount of uh, random variability so that we don't get um, the size of the level doesn't get too uh, uh, different, uh, which is kind of important because if we um, try to work out like how much XP a typical player is going to get, um, then uh, they, we won't be able to control it very well if the level can be like 50% larger for some people. Uh, so basically, um, yeah, that's a, a, the thing. Um, there's also an outdoor level here. Um, it took a little while to generate because um, we had to load all the assets with a different tile set. But um, uh, here's an example of a different type of generator outdoors, which um, this one here is using, uh, rather than using rooms, it's kind of using individual tiles. So for example, the river edge tile you saw before, there's something like that being placed around. And um, basically, uh, the uh, artists, or rather I should say the game level designers, what they're editing, rather than editing the level directly, um, they're editing um, a graph uh, that looks like this, which is effectively a high level, um, uh, high level description of what the area is like. So um, once again, I don't really know how to use this tool, but um, you can see sort of like um, nodes and edges here, as well as some specific tiles that have been placed um, that are always going to be in the level. Um, so I think this is the level right out of town, so there's kind of like the edge of the town tile at the top left there, and then a couple of like, there's like a boss arena in there and a few other things. Um, and there's like a shortcut here to open up the, the previous tool so you can see like what it would generate. Um, but if I like move around a couple of nodes and things like that, then um, 
how can we generate the level uh, based on those changes? And um, once again, this level is like quite highly constrained because it's one of the early levels. Um, and uh, but um, you can actually do very unconstrained levels, and that means that the um, generator is free to um, make the, uh, the those edges kind of really warp around the area quite a lot. Um, and so basically, there are lots of configurable variables on all the edges about like you know how much you're willing to let this kind of like um, change around. Um, but the topology will always be maintained. Uh, so yeah. Um, that's another one of our tools. And then just going th walking through a lot more of our tools, once again, um, this thing is our data tool. Uh, so this is what's used for entering all the balance data for the game. Um, so uh, you know, here what I'm doing is I'm just opening up an arbitrary table, which is like an uh, base item types table. Um, and then uh, that um, you know, has a bunch of items from the game in it with various properties. Uh, and then um, Basically, this is kind of trying to be a, a, like a surprising number of games use Excel for things like this. Um, basically, this is kind of like uh, Excel tailored to game development, where you've got like file references and references for all those tables and so on. And I kind of guess it sort of presents in a way a little bit like a um, relational database because, like, you know, you've got like constraints and indexes and all sort of stuff that you expect to have in a database, but it's kind of got a UI there that's designed for a game designer to use. And uh, one of the great things about this is that you can um, a game designer can create a new table. Uh, and then uh, code will automatically be generated um, for programmers to be able to access the data that they enter. Um, so here what I'm doing is I'm um, creating a new table um, with an ID and a string, and the string is marked for localization, um, which means that, um, you know, like the, the translator's translation system will come along later and, um, uh, you know, export that and queue that for, you know, translators to convert it into like 10 different languages. Um, you know, creating a random value, creating a reference, the mods uh, table, uh, and then I go to this code generator tab uh, and expose all of these to um, the code of the game. Uh, and then I can fill in some uh, arbitrary information, um, which isn't particularly interesting, but we'll just do those here. Um, and then, uh, so here, for example, you, know, you can see autocomplete on the reference column. Um, so that's kind of handy for a um, designer. And uh, then when I click the export button, buried in terrible menus because it's all custom tooling. Uh, we export um, uh, all the data and it also generates the code to access that data, which I'm going to alt-tab to in a second. Um, and you can see here the um, generated code for that. So basically there's the, a class for that um, table that I just created um, and then also a table um, which can, so basically that class represents the rows and then a table object which represents the whole um, table, so you can fetch the rows by ID and like you know, access all the different values and so on. And um, <coughs> um, it's kind of important because it means that the game designers can just kind of lay out whatever um, structures that they want um, and like you know what information they want to expose to the programmers, and then the programmers get easy access to that without having to actually do anything. Um, so that's the config editor, uh, and then you know we have all sorts of other stuff. Like for example, here's like our um, uh, AI scripting thing that we made. Um, here's like another random scripting language that we have for triggering stuff. So like this is the scripting language for the um, this is the script for the Crowbell fight that um, for that asset I showed you earlier. Um, you know it's just got random things like on start change to stance three, then do this thing. You know all that sort of stuff. Right? It's just like cryptic, but um, yeah, there's a scripting language there as well. So um, basically, yeah, we made all this stuff, like a lot of stuff. There's all sorts of tooling there, right? Like a whole bunch. Um, so uh, why the hell did we do that? Um, and it seems kind of crazy, like, you know, when a lot of people look at this stuff, they're like, oh, God, you really could have just used Unreal. I mean, come on. Um, but it is worth remembering um, that this was 2006. So let's look at sort of like what there existed in 2006 when we started um, for engines. So um, Unity technically existed in 2006. Nobody had heard of it. I certainly hadn't. Um, I believe at the time, I, you know, someone told me actually recently that it started out as like a Mac-only thing for like making iOS games, um, which doesn't sound right to me, but hey, that's what I heard. Uh, but anyway, in 2006, I had certainly not heard of Unity, um, so that was not an option. Um, then there, there was Unreal, right? There's the thing, like, today everyone's used to the concept that you can just, <coughs> oh, sorry, <coughs> you can just download um, Unreal and just use it, and then, like, if you actually release a game, if you make a certain amount of money, then you just pay them a percentage of that. But that was not how the licensing worked for Unreal Engine uh, back then. Uh, the licensing was a million US dollars um, just to, you know, to be able to use this thing. And uh, we certainly did not have a million US dollars lying around to be able to do that with. So um, basically, um, that was on the table. And honestly, even if we had used it, um, Unreal um, is uh, not the best thing for doing um, 
random level generation with. Uh, the whole sort of paradigm of the editor is just kind of not really designed around that. I mean, you can do it, like, absolutely, but it's just not really designed around it. Um, so games that have done that have kind of run into some issues um, uh, with that. Uh, and then, you know, same, same is true for things like, um, you know, Source Engine. It was a thing. You could license it. it was, you could do that, right? We could probably could have talked to Valve, made a deal, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the engine is really, really, really not designed for a level generation in the case of Source Engine. Uh, and there was all sorts of stuff. You know, there's like Gamebryo. This was like an engine that was used by quite a lot of commercial games back then. <coughs> um, this probably would have been a reasonable tool to use. Um, you know, kind of expensive. Um, in retrospect, it was great that it didn't use that because the thing died um, and uh, is no longer really in use. Um, and then there was open source engines like you know Ogre 3D and this kind of thing. I mean, this all around. Um, these are things you could use, um, uh, but once again, they just kind of weren't really great for our use case. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to random level generation. Like random level generation is a thing that uh, is not really like a lot of engines are not really designed around. So it's something that if you're going to tackle this, um, you kind of need to uh, be. Uh, you really need to think about like how how you're going to work with that. Um, you kind of need to end up creating a lot of your own editors and tools any, anyway. <coughs> um, so the engine isn't actually providing as much value as it otherwise would. And like, this is a bunch of um, justifications for why we did this. Um, but to be honest, uh, this is all kind of post hoc rationalization because um, really uh, most programmers just kind of hate working with other people's code. Certainly I do. Uh, and uh, really I just wanted to write my own engine because it's cool. And um, you know, if you actually read like a lot of people talking about uh, other engines, you often find a lot of people hating on Unity and Unreal. That's because it just sucks to use other people's code. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, basically I didn't care about a lot of that stuff and I just wanted to write my own engine anyway. Um, so that's what I did. And um, I think if you're going to do that, um, it really helps to know exactly what you're wanting to make. Um, it's kind of the superpower when it comes to writing your own tech, because if you have a vision of exactly what you're doing um, in your mind's eye, then it means you don't kind of waste time making all sorts of crap you don't need. And so I think a lot of the advice that people have for, like, don't make your own engine really comes from the point of, like, you know, if you're just making an engine rather than a game, um, then you're kind of not really uh, going towards um, what you need to do. You're, um, you know, just making random features that no one will ever use. Um, so I think that was kind of important. Um, so anyway, um, this is an interesting screenshot. So uh, this is one month into development right here of um, Path of XR. There's a surprising amount of code uh, from this thing here, still in the game as it ships today. Um, so we started in um, late 2006. I mean, so I, I literally graduated from university in 2006, right, from the University of Auckland. And um, we, uh, uh, my best friend at the time, Chris, um, you know, we knew that we wanted to make a game. We knew the type of game we wanted to make. Um, so pretty much we just launched straight into, uh, you know, straight out of university, um, we just started working on this. And, uh, we didn't have any art, uh, like we didn't have a lead artist at the time, um, so we just kind of I, I made just like programmer art, and um, this is kind of what we had. So this I, I say it's a month, and you kind of look at that and go like that was that really a month's work? But here's the thing: um, we knew that we were making an online multiplayer game. Uh, this thing actually has a uh, like a backend server and account system. Um, there's like characters, game instances. There's all sorts of multiplayer stuff. This is actually a multiplayer asteroids game right here. Um, so uh, that's kind of fun. Uh, you could log in with multiple characters and um, fire projectiles at each other. I don't have any video of this time because um, we weren't really thinking about preservation or anything like that at the time. So we managed to dig up this screenshot a while back, um, and uh, this is kind of all that remains there. But it's still technically in the uh, source control history. Um, you know, we could roll all the way back to here and probably build this again and get it working with a bit of some effort, so that might be a little bit fun. Um, and then um, <coughs> here we are in um, early 2007, so the next year. Um, so effectively, it's probably like three months of development, something like that. Um, we got our uh, artist, our lead artist, into the country. Uh, and that meant that I could take the concept art that he was drawing and um, put it on the sides of boxes. So uh, this is, uh, yeah, as you can see, we actually had a name to the game at this point, which is why it says at the top, Grinding Gears Game. Um, and uh, we did name our company, though. <laughs> and um, so yeah, basically, this is um, actually getting started on um, actually a lot of game systems. Um, we're using DirectX 9 to uh, render the stuff. And um, once again, it looks simple, but there's actually quite a lot of stuff going on in the background because, uh, for example, here I can open the inventory and we've got a full item system there. And there's actually quite a lot of code stuff. We had an entity component system at this point. Um, we're actually fairly early for this. It was based on the um, Dungeon Siege uh, document where they, they, were, they were probably the earliest game to use entity component system. Um, and so we have something like that, which we're using for the item system and the game object system and a few other things. We've got pathfinding. We've got all sorts of stuff in here um, that, uh, that we had. And, um, but a lot of our time, honestly, we just spent like doing game design, right? Like, I mean, we were like three guys in a garage 
um, making a game. So like half the time we just spent talking about random shit. Um, and that is indeed, um, here's a random picture we have from the time we were working out like the color pie and like where weapons would go and that kind of stuff. So a lot of our time spent doing that as well. Um, so then moving on. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Here we are in mid-2007. Uh, uh, so basically this um, slide here, uh, once again, doesn't look like much, but there's quite a lot going on once again. So here we have um, a whole asset pipeline exporting from Maya. We can export animations. Uh, we can export, um, obviously, meshes and tiles. We've got tile system. We've got resource loading, like a whole resource system for sharing resources between um, different objects and um, levels. And uh, once again, you know, like we're starting to get into, um, I believe, I don't think the action system was great at this point. I think it did have, like, basic melee attacks, but it really kind of sucked. Um, but uh, we definitely cared about those items. Um, so that's why we were uh, focusing on that on a lot of the screenshots that we took. Uh, and here's a little bit later. So this is like late 2007. So I'd say this is one year of development right here. Uh, the normal maps are actually backwards on the floor, which I didn't notice at the time. Um, but whatever. Um, and um, we're actually starting to get quite a lot of game systems here. Once again, hard to see from screenshots, but um, you know, uh, we're starting to do some UI. Um, we've got an action system. You can see on the right that there's like, you know, my character's got like fireball and leap slam equipped. Uh, you can see the flask system that we have um, down the left. There's evidence that that exists. Um, and uh, there's, um, as I said, there's quite a lot of work that's gone into this. Um, so one thing I do have a video of, though, oh, sorry, actually, before I get to that. Um, but, I mean, once again, there's, there's a huge amount of other stuff that you just don't see, right? Like, so, for example, um, I'd made this, like, patching system um, for the game because there's something that we needed. And this is just something I sort of threw together in a week over Christmas. Um, and it's still in use today, pretty mostly unchanged. Um, so, you know, there's things like this in there, right? There's, that's like a week of the 52 weeks in a year for that, and there's like all sorts of stuff that you just don't think about, like file system stuff and all, all sorts of things. Um, so, uh, now I have a video. So because um, a few years ago, um, Chris actually did check out an old version of Path of Exile from the repository and uh, built it and got it working, like assembling old libraries and random shit. Um, and uh, this is what we had. So this is in um, late 2008. So actually, actually a whole year later. Um, and um, it does look very similar to what we had before, but um, once again, it's because um, a lot of the work is kind of not being shown off. But um, here's like a really stiff animation of the ranger walking around. There's chests that you can open. Like, it does generate random items, although they didn't happen to drop any there. And um, uh, I think there's shadows, which wasn't in the last uh, screenshot. Um, I think so there had been some more engine work. Um, I believe that we might have the material system starting to come in here, although I don't see any evidence of it on the screen. Um, and you can see the sort of terrible animations we had because, like, you know, um, we just weren't really very good at it back then. Um, actually, by the standards of the time, it's, like, not quite as bad as you might think. Um, like, I actually looked at some contemporary games from 2008, and, like, they look quite a lot worse than what I remembered. Um, oh, yeah, that, that zombie death, though, I mean, come on. Um, that's like, <laughs> he just kind of floats to the ground. Um, so that's kind of, uh, kind of crappy. But we got a lot better at this stuff, so that's cool. Um, and uh, there is a combat system. There's um, stats and things. Um, you can still see there's still some things that have concept art just um, on them um, because we didn't have art made for those yet. Um, so like the items on the ground don't have any concept art. And there all the item um, hovers are like uh, stacking on top of each other because we didn't have like a layout system for UI yet. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's stuff going on here. And um, as I said, there's a lot more to this than what meets the eye. Um, because uh, very, not too much longer after that, um, although I suppose it actually, no, you know what, it's quite a long time. Uh, this is uh, when we, a trailer that we did when we announced the game. Um, so this is actually September 2010. Um, so we were not good at making trailers back then. Um, but uh, it actually doesn't look too bad. Um, there's like particles being used there. We did the whole particle system between them. Um, there's a trail system being used on the arrows there. Um, and actually, surprisingly, the engine um, is kind of mostly done. Um, we've got the material system definitely by this point. Um, you know, for, for, so like, like a buff goes on someone and then it modifies the materials. And so like you can ice someone and then they can cover them ice. Um, skill systems, um, it's all multiplayer. We've got the passive skill tree in there um, and uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, oh yeah, and the data system, the config editor, that's all done. So effectively by this point, um, basically, pretty much, like, at least a version of everything that you saw before was actually in. Um, so it's pretty much three years from the point we started when I'd say, like, the engine was kind of, like, feature complete enough 
to create an action RPG that is releasable. And um, as I said, it sort of sounds like maybe it's a long time, but then we were making the game uh, during that time as well. Uh, so it was actually not too bad, and um, also designing it and so on. And really, like, a kind of a lot of the, um, the time, um, honestly, is uh, art anyway. Like, we had to learn, like, how to make a game and how to do animation and all sort of stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah. And um, just to sort of show you what we sort of delivered on that stack, um, when we went up to open beta launch um, two and a half years later, um, uh, here's what we had. And honestly, I'd been pretty much working on gameplay and back-end stuff this entire time. So oh, this, this, this trailer here looked quite significantly better than the one we just saw before, and yet the technology of it is pretty much the same without almost no modifications, really. Um, so um, it's you know, looking a lot better. And it really just comes down to we got an effects artist who was good, and we got um, animators who were getting better, and uh, we you know, like made a lot of art, we got better at making trailers and so on. Um, and so this is actually what we um, went into open beta with. And at this point, we were a game like making money um, uh, and doing well, and you know, cash flow positive, I guess you'd say, all these sorts of things, um, with an engine that pretty much, I mean, in terms of like almost all of the engine features, I pretty much wrote myself. Um, the random limit generation was done by someone else. Um, but pretty much all the rest of the engine features were just me, um, and we had some gameplay programmers as well who worked on like skills and, and, and other and UI and other things like that. Um, and this is like a single threaded um, DirectX 9 game engine here. And um, this actually got us surprisingly far. Like, I mean, you know, we, 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 we like, honestly, I'm, I'm sort of surprised like how well we did considering how bodged together all of this was. And um, the funny thing is, is that like even um, like, way after that, so this is the sound of this video and there shouldn't be, um, but even like way after that, this is like 2016 and we still were using that same tech. I mean sure there have been a few modifications but honestly like we'd barely changed anything. And so <coughs> <coughs> it's kind of six years pretty much of just working on that same um, that same tech stack and uh, I would say though like this was kind of the point though by the time we got to this uh, stage of development that the engine was really starting to show its uh, age um, because uh, we were starting to get a lot of performance issues and like things like that you know like uh, the amount of art that had been added to the game was really large you know like loading times were getting long that's kind of thing so um, this was kind of the point where I stopped being the maintainer of the Path of Exile engine myself and uh, we hired uh, a programmer to work on optimization and um, I can show you that um, on the next slide like a video we made where um, this video is about um, the multi-threading we did. So taking a single-threaded thing and then multi-threading it is like kind of a pain uh, if you weren't expecting to multi-thread it when you first made it. So um, this here on the top left, you can see like a trace of like the different cores um, that I'm changing between single-threaded and multi-threaded mode here. Um, so this is currently in single-threaded mode where it's like dropping frames and then I move to multi-threaded mode where everything packs down much more nicely across all the different cores. And um, there's kind of like a pretty reasonable demo down here where I do um, a much more hectic um, test. Uh, this is an old video, by the way, when we first did this, um, which is why the game looks a lot worse now than it did in the previous videos. Uh, but here we uh, gack a lot of monsters and then attack them, and the frame rate is actually holding up. And then when I turn off multi threading in a second, um, uh, now it chugs really hard. Uh, and so basically, um, you know, we hired a programmer to do this. Um, he managed to do this um, within, I don't know, it was probably like four or five months before we got to that result. Um, and then uh, we did a lot more work, um, you know, with once again, one, having one more engine program was like a huge skill. Like we managed to get the engine to the point where we could spam like nobody's business and um, the frame rate just completely holds up. Um, so uh, basically uh, we added here, in order to get this, we like optimized the particle engine. We made it use like, um, I don't know if you know what SI, SIMD is, but basically like optimizing using like special CP, uh, CPU opcodes. Um, we optimized creating objects, um, basically doing a lot more threading stuff, um, and then we also added dynamic resolution scaling. Um, and uh, so by the time we launched 3.0.0, which was um, 2017, June 2017, um, we were able to do scenes like this um, without really dropping many frames. Uh, and there was like a lot more engine optimization work after this, right? Like there's years and years more of just like hammering on it. But honestly, like um, a lot of the important stuff really didn't take that long to do. Um, uh, once, you know, like, like the vast, like there's kind of the low hanging fruit thing of where like, you know, you'd put in like 10% of the work and you get like 90% of the result. And like, that's a little bit unfair to like the years of work that were put in after that. But I mean, yeah, a lot of what made this a lot faster was just like these simple changes. So um, then the other thing we did was we hired a guy from Russia 
Um, and so he effectively, he had a math PhD and he was able to make things like this happen. Uh, so here he's made like a fluid simulation, which, um, you know, uh, makes like water systems like that go. This is once again an old video, but, um, you know, this is like what it looked like when we released it. Uh, and he was also able to do things like the global illumination tech, um, point light shadows and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And basically over the time we've kind of evolved the renderer since, yeah, sort of late 2016 to what we have now where we've got uh, forward plus lighting, we're using PBR materials to everything, um, and uh, basically, you know, improve the tools and so on. So, um, yeah, basically that was kind of like an old man talks about history for a while there. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess, um, what is my overall opinion then, having done all of that, about uh, whether you should make your own engine? Well, what I will say is that um, it's a lot more fun than uh, not making your own engine. Um, but uh, only if you really like writing code. And I do like writing code, right? Like, I've written a lot of code uh, about all sorts of random things. Like, pretty much every random thing you could think of about game development. At some point, I've written something to do to deal with that thing. Um, so, you know, you're talking about, like, rendering and editors and patching and file systems and resource systems and component systems and animation. Like, you know, I've made a scripting language, an AI system, pathfinding, um, items, like all this, all this stuff. There's just like so many random things. Like, there's like a sound thing that we did, although we moved to FMOD eventually. Like, you know, we've done pretty much everything. And there's all sorts of stuff that you don't even think of as associated with game development uh, that you end up writing. Like, you know, I've done like a huge amount of database work. There was like years spent there of uh, database stuff. And I'd, I'd need that regardless of having a third party engine. Um, uh, you know, like uh, clients server networking, distributed systems. Um, you know, I've written a build system, uh, asset testing system. Um, you know, I've written a plugin for PHP. Um, you know, like, why the hell would someone do that? Um, I've written a web server. Um, yeah, once again, why would someone do that? Um, there is a reason. Uh, and we did it at one point. And um, basically, I guess I would say that um, uh, it's nice to have all that experience, but you have to enjoy writing code, which, as I said, I do. Uh, but the other thing that I would say is that um, it's actually not, like, that hard. Um, like, it seems like it's hard, but um, it's really not that hard as long as you don't overcomplicate things. And so what do I mean by that? Basically, the key thing is, like, do the simplest thing that could work. Like, don't waste your time making something that's like perfect, you kind of really just have to be like ruthlessly target your goal. And as soon as you reach the minimum you need to make the game that you are making, um, you kind of go with that. Um, and so that's kind of important. It's really not like that. As I said, as I said it didn't, like, and the other thing is that it doesn't like take that long. Um, so, um, so long as um, you know what you're making. So that's like really important. So um, yeah, we knew exactly what we were making. We knew we were making a, uh, you know, action RPG like Diablo. Uh, we had very clearly in our minds exactly what we want to do and what systems we want to do and so on. So that means that we can, you know, only make exactly the things that we need um, for that game, uh, which is what we did. Uh, and then lastly, you actually can make, like, world-class graphics tech. Like, it's not actually out of reach. Um, you just have to hire a guy with a PhD from Russia. So, uh, yeah. Um, that's kind of my opinion on making engines. Um, I really think that... Um, you guys should do it too. Uh, one thing that we are doing is we are hiring. Um, so if anyone wants a job, then definitely contact us. Um, you can email hr at graininggear.com uh, to be able to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to um, ask whatever questions that you have. So yeah. I've got to explain how they can install it. Um, the stuff about the engine itself was more like, um, when I play the game, <coughs> Um, so basically this question is about uh, what people would call path of Excel. Um, so <laughs> basically uh, the whole like, you know, you, uh, you have to spend a lot of time going and researching stuff on the internet. So basically the, the, the answer that I have to that is like, it depends what type of player you are. So um, I'm the type of player who likes to just go into a game and I like things to kind of be complicated and I like to explore that. Um, and so that's kind of like why the game is like what it is. Um, because like we just like kind of, you know, hey, there's a whole bunch of systems there. Let's go explore them and have a look at them. So I would advise anyone... Um, who starts playing PoE to just um, start playing the game, don't go read random build guides on the internet, and uh, just sort of experience it, and you won't make a character that's like, you know, uh, like, good relative to the stuff that everyone else is doing uh, your first time, um, but hopefully you'll actually enjoy the experience and have fun. 
uh, and then you, you know, if you want to play again later, then you'll kind of learn more and more as you go through. Um, that isn't to say that it's like I feel like you shouldn't look stuff up online or anything. Like that's perfectly valid. It's just that you know the type of player that I am is someone who doesn't do that, and that's why I like to kind of like have kind of interesting and I guess slightly complex systems. Um, uh, and uh, over the years, we've kind of tried to uh, expose more of the information directly in the game. Like a, a lot of people were concerned about this, you know, oh, you have to go to, like random people's uh, websites to find out that information. But uh, we have kind of tried to expose more and more of it. So the leagues that we design now um, tend to have a lot more of that information exposed. So hopefully that's less of a problem. But I mean, there's still a lot of old stuff. And, you know, um, you know, I mean, yeah, kind of like to some extent, it's kind of just like that's how the game is. Like, you know, if you're going to play like a lot of competitive online games, uh, you will have to probably at some point go on the internet and watch some people's strategies. Um, so we're not unique in that regard. But um, yeah, basically, yeah, that's our game. It's kind of complicated. <laughs> Next question. Um, I've read some other experiences of um, making a game and then they sort of break down. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the number 13 that I read once where they were sort of like laying down the tracks of the train and trying to drive at the same time. There was a lot of frustration of like um, trying to use things in memory that weren't properly broken. Mm -hmm. So do you have any issues with you know, holding up other people's like, pieces and that sort of stuff? Or anything like that? Um, so the question was about um, whether or not we're holding up people's work um, by uh, not having the game, uh, the engine features ready in time. Um, so I would say it wasn't so much that. Um, the main thing, though, that we had to get across to the artists, I mean, so, so we actually were very slow at hiring at the start. Like, it was kind of the three of us, and then maybe, like, I think, maybe, like, it was kind of like eight people or something for quite a long time, and, like, a lot of, most of those were programmers at the beginning. So we kind of didn't really have this um, problem as much. And also, we were the programmers who were designing the game as well. Like we didn't have dedicated game designers. Um, so it kind of wasn't an issue so much there for us. However, I think the thing that is really important is that um, the artists who are working with you understand the fact that they don't have to live with the tyranny of the engine uh, when you've got a custom engine. You can just walk over to the programmer and be like, this feature would be useful. Um, and so that's kind of really important. So like, you actually kind of get the situation where it's like, it's not so much a question of like, the features aren't ready in time because um, if you, as long as you're hiring slowly enough like we were, having very little money. Um, but it's more of a question of just like making sure the artists understand the fact that, um, yeah, like we can actually modify this thing. We can make changes. Like if you are wasting your time doing some long thing or like working around problems, you need to come to me and like ask me like, how can I do this thing? And I might like, there was a, there's a, like a, a random anecdote along these lines. Like the, the other day, okay, this is years ago, but I say the other day, um, <laughs> there was, uh, an animator who, um, was animating the wheels on like a, on like a cart. Uh, it was, um like a town that had a bunch of wheels. And uh, different elements of this asset had um, wheels that were different sizes. So they made an animation for uh, rotating the wheels. And um, the problem is that when you've got two wheels that are different sizes, um, what's the length of the animation you need to be able to have that loop cleanly? Um, the answer is the lowest common multiple of the um, rotation periods of the, of the wheels, right? So because this thing had like, um, I don't know, like five different wheel sizes and um, uh, the... Uh, lowest common, and like they're all kind of funny sizes, the lowest common multiple ended up being an animation that was like four hours long. So they went and they made that, and I think they like used a bit of like script in Maya to like make that, and they exported this thing, it took like freaking hours to export because the thing is really not designed for animating, like for exporting multi-hour long animations. You know, it's expected that you're exporting like one, two second clips, right? Um, and they worked through all of this, and it was like a pain in the build process, and the animation file, like the file that it produced, like the asset on the disk was like a gigabyte in size or something ridiculous like that, and all this stuff happened, right? So, and they were trying to like work through all these problems, and it's like, the moment that I heard about this, I'm like, what the hell are you doing, guys? I can write code in like five seconds to animate that wheel with code, and you won't even have to worry about animating this thing. You won't, like, you know, it's just, like, the whole thing is just like totally not a problem that you should be solving as an animator. You know what I mean? So what I'm saying is, is that like when you've got a custom engine, it's like it's very easy for a programmer just to go in and just like write some quick thing and like make a change. Um, you don't have to fight with your tools and hack things in. You can actually do it like you know in a good way. So this feels like I've kind of gone a bit tangentially to what you're asking, but it kind of somehow seems connected to me. So uh, that's my answer to your question. Um, yeah, any other questions? Uh, sure. Uh, yes, I have a few questions from Twitch chat. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so, um, I have a question here just uh, from Paul345 uh, asking what would be the current technical limitations that you are struggling with at the moment? Um, I mean, honestly, so the, the question was what are the current technical limitations we're struggling with? Um, 
I don't know that there's anything, one thing that jumps out. Um, certainly in the past, there were issues with like specific performance problems that we had. Um, the Undertaker is getting pretty good now. Um, like uh, we've kind of got like most of the features that we need for making PoE two with anyway. Um, I guess like one of the things that a lot of the um, uh, PoE like so Path of Exile one is what's currently deployed and people can play. And so there's a lot of issues um, that are kind of not easily solvable there because of the old assets that we're using. Um, and so like, and okay, this is something that we've never said to anyone, but like, and because this is somewhat ridiculous, but like Path of Exile 2, the reason that we're making it is literally because we were like, these rigs on the characters are terrible. We need to change these rigs. And like, it literally feature creeped from we need to make new rigs to we're making a sequel. Um, so <laughs> um, that basically... Um, the, uh, um, so like a lot of the problems that you have, like animations and things like, like the, 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 the gameplay feeling stiff, like all sorts of like issues that people have with POE1 online right now, are literally just because like we're using these old rigs and like when you like make a new rig, you have to like re-rig all of the things that um, are attached to that rig again. Um, and so there's like literally just years of work for people just like re-rigging all of the old uh, like microtransactions that we've already sold to people um, onto these new rigs. And it's like, we made this new stuff and the quality was so much better. We're like, oh, we really need to like, when we're releasing this, we need to make like, um, like, a, like a, a new act one because you know, like act one would be um, like, would be terrible if like we had these like really new looking characters with the old terrain assets. And so we start making a new act one. And then it just like, as I said, it just feature creeped into a whole sequel. So uh, basically, yeah, I don't think there's necessarily that many technical limitations that we're facing with the Path of Exile 2 at this point. Like, you know, a lot of the, <coughs> we've kind of, uh, you know, like, made a pretty damn good engine here with all the features that we really need. Um, but yeah, the, probably the main limitation we're facing is just old art assets holding us back, um, which some, is something that Path of Exile 2 will not have a problem with. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, anyone else got a question here? Um, oh, yes, um, following that up, a friend of mine, and since you partially mentioned it, um, what assets would you be reusing from Path of Exile to Path of Exile 2? Because I've heard some, um, from a little bit in the community, that you'll use some assets potentially for Path of Exile 2 in Path of Exile as well. Uh, yeah, so um, the question was what Path of Exile 1 assets we're using in Path of Exile 2. Um, the answer is kind of like um, anything. So anything that's, okay. We want to make sure that we're using a lot of the League content that we've made, although it will be modified for PoE2. Um, but basically, there has to be a sort of minimum bar of quality for something to get from Path of Exile 1 to PoE2. Um, so that effectively means that we have to, at the very least, use only PBR assets. So that's physically-based rendering-based materials. Um, so anything that's older than a certain cutoff date, we won't use, or else we'll have to modify in order to um, make it sort of up to the quality standards that we have. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that like a lot of the game systems, I mean, they'll be modified, but a lot of these game systems that we've worked hard on, there's a lot of back-end stuff for and all this sort of thing, a lot of that will, will come in. Um, but in terms of art assets, basically, it just has to, it has to be good enough quality for it to make it in. Um, and yeah, as I said, the minimum bar is basically uh, physically-based rendering assets, um, which we started doing, uh, shit, I don't know which, which year it would be. Um, probably like, um, it was a bit after, it was sort of like some of the 300 assets, I think. Um, like probably three, four years ago, we're starting to use that those techniques. Um, probably like three years ago, I'd say. Probably assets from around then. Um, all the new stuff we make make now is all um, good enough to be shippable. Um, you know, like all the characters and stuff that we make, everything they're all good enough to be shippable in PoE two. Um, and like all, like bosses and stuff like that, they're just so much better than they used to be. Um, so like a lot of that stuff is really good. But um, so we can use that stuff uh, in, in PoE two. But yeah, anyway, that's that was that question. Any other questions? Ah, uh, yeah, over there. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. Um, but my question was, um, I was wondering what's the next big milestone for Path of Exile, um, the, the sequel that you're working on. Um, mm -hmm. And what, what's your kind of, what are your plans for like, you know, the future, so like five, ten years time? If you're even thinking that far ahead, I know I'm not. Right. Um, so the question was, what are our plans for the future? What's the next big milestone? You know, where are we going as a company in our lives, I guess. <laughs> um, so the answer to that really is that, um, so the sequel is the thing that, um, so okay, so there's two things that, that our company is doing. One of them is um, we are making an expansion every three months. We have to keep doing that because it's kind of what keeps the game going and what keeps the community alive. Um, so we, we do that. And the other thing that we're doing is we're making our sequel, um, which is a, a multi-year project. We've been working on it for years so far. It's probably going to take another while yet to do. Um, 
And uh, we have to make our company a lot bigger as well to be able to do that. So um, we're currently looking to hire a lot more staff, um, especially artists. We need a lot of artists to be able to make all this content. Um, so our company needs to get bigger. Um, so I'd say um, that uh, our company may probably even double in size um, over the next few years. Uh, we're currently 160. We want to double that. Um, so uh, yeah, we're getting bigger. Um, and uh, we, we're just going to continue to work on um, Path of Exile, honestly. Um, like, we don't have any plans to make, like, another game or anything like that. I mean, the sequel is the other game um, that we're working on. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's kind of, like, that's kind of where we're going. And uh, I, I, I know that when POE 2 is released, it's going to be, like, okay, like, POE 1, it's, like, it's good, but it's not, like, good enough for me. Like, it's not kind of, like, I kind of look, I like, when I play it, I'm, like, this is awful. Because I see, like, all the flaws. Um, whereas when I play, like, POE 2, I'm like, okay, um, this is actually a good game now. Like, we're actually making, like, a proper, like, real game. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's, it's actually, like, I, I find it actually hard to play Path of Exile online anymore because it's, like, it's so much worse than what POE 2 is that um, it's, it's hard to go back to. Like, the things I was talking about, about, like, the old character rigs just, like, make the combat feel so terrible compared to what we're doing in POE 2 that, like... Um, yeah, so yeah, basically we're making a good game now, and it's AAA and like good and stuff, and yeah, basically I guess I guess the, the, the succinct answer of what is your plan uh, for the future is we're going to beat Diablo 4. Uh -huh. uh, that would be the succinct answer, I guess. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, yeah, any other questions? I just have a question when it comes to the fourth update of Path of Exile, because <coughs> uh, it, is, it is really amazing how big the game is despite being a relatively small file size, about 25 gigabytes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's just so he said he said it's surprising how big the game is considering it's only twenty five gigabytes. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, I remember that like to me the game is like four gigabytes in my mind. Yeah. It's like, you know, the children grow up so fast. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, during the four updates, how much of the files do you actually how much, how many of the files do you actually compress and change over to legacy code, basically? Uh so you're asking like how much of the um of, of, like how much? Like, I guess you're just asking about sort of compression and file yeah, compression, system yeah. stuff and all. Yeah, yeah, okay, this kind of stuff. Okay, so basically, um, over the years we've um, uh, changed things quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, when we shipped the game initially, there was just like no compression, um, and the game was small because the art assets were were, were small because um, like you know they were old. Mm -hmm. um, these days they're getting a lot bigger. Um, nowadays we're using um, we actually use a um, uh, what's it called uh, uh, company that makes uh, rad rad game tools. We're using the um, compression libraries that they. Have, um, they've got some really good compression libraries, um, and those uh, squash things down significantly. Uh, and you know, we've just put a lot of work into making sure the game is smaller. Um, the uh, all the old content is kind of like a lot smaller, just by the nature of the fact that it's like lower quality texture and so on. Mm -hmm. And the other thing as well is like a, a lot of games are sort of unnecessarily large these days, and part of that is because um, it takes a lot of time to uh, shrink assets down to the size that. Um, I guess would be the minimum viable amount you need to ship them. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, really, when you're making, like, a, say, a console game, uh, the only thing you really have to care about is, like, how big is the maximum size I can ship on a disc. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of optimize down to that point, and then that's what you ship. Mm -hmm. uh, and on PC, I guess they figure that, like, people's connections are fast, so that's, we'll just, you know, we'll just ship that. That's being a little bit unfair. I mean, there's lots of optimization that does go on. But, um, you know, like, yeah, games could be smaller. Um, and uh, we kind of do try and uh, bear this in mind when we're making assets to kind of shrink them down as much as possible. And we've got like visualization modes and stuff like in the editor so you can see like, am I making like a, you know, and this literally does happen. I have I got like a, a 4K texture on my arrow, um, you know, like this kind of thing seriously actually ships. Um, so uh, yeah, like uh, that's the kind of mistakes that just randomly happen. And you honestly don't even notice this shit half the time. So um, yeah, basically uh, go through all the assets, see which ones are big and try to cull them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, any other questions in the room over there? Um, so he's asking uh, internally, how do you sort of maintain excitement for the game? I mean, yeah, we've been going for a real long time, right? Like a lot of people might think, oh, you've been making this game for like 14 years. Um, are you still excited about it? Um, and I guess the answer to that basically is that um, you have to have, um, uh, I mean, we, we have expansions every three months. We try to make sure that in each one there's kind of some kind of interesting game about it that makes it feel like new and different. Um, so it has to sort of feel like uh, there is something, you know, like we, it's like every, it's like in one, in one respect we're just making the same game for 14 years, but in another respect we get to make a new game every three months. 
Um, so that's kind of like, I guess, the important thing is like, there's also prototyping and interesting stuff. We really try to sort of like be quite creative with our expansions. Um, like if they're not just that we, you know, like ideally if we're doing our job well, they're not too formulaic. Um, they should feel like, you know, they kind of got something interesting. We Honestly, one of the things we like to do is kind of take inspiration from other games uh, for our expansions. So like here's a mechanic that another game had, like let's make a three-monthly, uh, similar, similar to that. Um, or like sometimes it's literally just like, I'm going to go through a movie list. Hey, here's a movie that's cool. I'm going to make an expansion that's kind of in a similar vein. Um, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, basically we have to keep things interesting. But yes, it's very hard, um, especially as the team gets larger. Um, like when the, as the team gets larger and larger, it gets harder and harder. Like when you've got a hundred people team, you can kind of almost talk to everybody and know who they are and like you know kind of get them excited. Um, we, as you get above that, it's like impossible, right? So like 150, 160, you just you know because you don't even know. Um, so yeah, uh, that is a problem. But hopefully you can deal with it. Uh, anyone else in the room? Over there? Um, so the question here is about problem solving, like how do you solve something that just seems really hard to solve? Um, I guess the answer to that is like, I mean, there's no like one technique I can tell you to like solve problems. I mean, ultimately you just have to kind of bash your head at it. Um, it helps uh, when you've got uh, technical friends who you can talk to and uh, work through your reasoning with. Um, so like other people are very important. Um, but I think one of the other um, things as well is uh, problems around like, you know, Person A says, I want, it, I think it should be designed this way. And person B says, I think it should be designed that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, how do you deal with those problems, which is, like, another big issue. Mm -hmm. um, and the only technique I have for that one is basically um, when you have come to those kinds of disagreements, um, usually both people have some kind of point and some reason why they think the way they do. Uh, so the technique that I would suggest is basically just take both people's options off the table and basically say we have to come up with a third thing which is going to satisfy both uh, of these people's issues. And uh, some of the time what will happen is, is that you'll, you'll take both of those things off the table and then the other person will come around to the idea that the other person had um, because they realize that actually it's better. Um, but I think taking the ego out of it by saying like both of these ideas are completely off the table now, we have to come up with something new, um, is something that can help uh, when you're coming to those kinds of problems. Uh, so yeah, that's a one issue, one, one technique anyway that we have. Um, anyone else in the room uh, do we have for, oh, over there. <coughs> Um, so the question was, how did I get into programming? Um, the answer was, I went to a, uh, when I was about probably 10 years old, um, I went to a game development, uh, uh, like teach kids how to code kind of thing uh, when I was in intermediate school. Uh, and uh, basically from the moment that I did that, I was like, I'm going to be a game programmer. So I was pretty much set on my course from that point. I just really loved uh, writing code. Um, and I guess what I love about it is just like, you know, um, I don't know, like you get to make things that other people can use and like it makes sense to me and like, you know, unlike people that are complicated, programming is actually kind of simple in a way, <laughs> something like that. It's like the Asperger's syndrome answer, I suppose, um, to that uh, question. Um, but uh, yeah, basically, uh, that's why I really, and I've always loved programming since I was a kid. Um, so yeah, basically, yeah. Um, I've got one question here. Yep. Um, Uh, so if I was a student now, what would I do to make a game, a game dev studio? So um, it's a tough question um, because uh, probably the largest issue, honestly, um, with making games is not actually the making a game part. It's uh, getting anyone to care. Uh, and um, it's tough. And it kind of gets tougher the longer time goes on because there's more and more people... Um, you know, using the great tools that you have at their disposal, uh, making games and like how do you get attention. Uh, so I guess the answer to that is, um, first of all, don't make a mobile game because you will never get any attention there. Um, so at the very least, so start, uh, make a game on PC. Absolutely, right? You're much more likely to get something done. Uh, you have to make something which someone can see a five second clip of it and be like, oh, that's cool. Um, that is important. Um, uh, so definitely do that. Um, if you can, Find a game that people already like, but nobody has made anything in that genre for a while, and make a clone of that. Um, it sounds very uh, like flippant to say things like this, but honestly, it really works because you've got an audience built in, and all you have to do is find that audience and talk to them, um, and it worked for us. Um, so that's something that I think is, 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 is really good. So yeah, um, 
that can help a lot. Um, so I guess these are like really practical advices for how to actually make something. Um, but in terms of the actual making, the, the part where you actually make the game, um, I guess, uh, yeah, uh, simple is better, right? Like do, just don't overcomplicate things. You know, like make, make, them, make, them, make the minimum to get the gameplay working and really focus on getting the gameplay fun and like feeling good because like that's the part that will actually, um, uh, you know, make people enjoy your game. Um, so yeah, that, I guess that's the advice that I have. Yeah. So the kind of final question for me is, apparently it's a question from Twitch, in that how do you effectively communicate to people that third-party assets aren't worth it to <coughs> take the developer's time when it comes to making an asset to to your game? So from, from the... <coughs> Sorry, I'm not sure what you're asking. Yeah. Um, from the sounds of things, a lot of Travel Exile players are wanting Grinding Gate to make third party stuff in game, but it doesn't. Is that actually something? Are you, are you asking about mod support? Mod Is that support, what you're asking yeah. for? Okay, right. Uh, so, mods are pretty hard to um, support in like an online secure realm. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, you know, like if you've got a like sort of an offline game or a game where like the servers are shipped with it, then it's like a lot easier for people to make mods. Um, there are things you can do, I suppose we could do, um, but honestly, it's like yeah, I suppose we could support like third party content, but I mean, you know, we've got a sequel to make. It's just kind of not on our radar really. Um, so yeah, basically, um, I don't think mods are going to be a thing that's going to come anytime soon, honestly. Um, but yeah. Uh, be cool, just not on our priority list. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, any other questions in the room? Uh, Over there? Yeah. Uh, when you guys first started out making the game, why did you guys, well, why did you guys choose a free to play model? All right, so he's asking, why did we choose free to play? Um, so the answer to that basically is um, uh, at the time when we started in 2006, there were no Western free to play games at all, like just zero. Um, it was a thing that was big in um, Asia. So um, you had things like, God, I can't even remember the names, like Maple Story, uh, like, uh, I'm trying to think, like, um, other, there, were other, there, were, there were definitely a bunch of Asian games um, that uh, were free to play, and the model worked there. And so our thinking was basically, hey, we could be like the first free to play game in the Western world. Um, and that was definitely not the case, because we took so long to make it. Um, so by the time we came out, there were actually a bunch, and so it kind of felt like the boat had like kind of left. Um, and like part of it honestly was like we didn't think we could compete on the level of like with a, with with like premium games because we were like just like some guys in a garage in New Zealand like we couldn't we didn't really think like we could sell a game for um, you know like a hundred dollars that's New Zealand dollars um, so uh, basically yeah uh, we were kind of like there was it was two reasons yeah one of them was like this was a model that no one else had done really in the West and the other one was um, we just thought that we were much more likely to be able to get people to actually try it and we kind of believed that if we could get people to try it then um, uh, people would enjoy it. Um, today, of course, there's so many free games and all games are so cheap that like this is much less of a strategy. But back then, it was legit, right? Like there weren't there were so few free games to play that like it was actually a legitimate marketing strategy of like, hey, you could try this. Um, so yeah, basically that was our, our thinking, um, and that kind of ended up working out. We did actually do quite a lot of, um, uh, for lack of a better word, market research about like whether or not this would actually be a viable business strategy, um, and we basically found that um, with that model, you could actually um, itch, it. I th I th you could actually um, make a reasonable amount of money that way. Um, and it turned out even that our expectations were kind of low compared to what can be made, and that's why so many people are, are doing it today. But um, yeah, basically, yeah, those are the reasons. So yeah, there you go. Anyone else in the room? Over there? Uh, the answer is, uh, did I play many games growing up? Um, yes. <laughs> I, I doubt you'll find many people who uh, want to be a game programmer from age 10 who don't enjoy playing games. Um, but the answer is um, kind of everything. So like, I mean, like, okay, what, what like, obviously Diablo, right? Like, the game, I played quite a lot of that. Um, uh, you know, like RTSs, I mean, you've got your like StarCraft and WarCraft and Age of Empires and stuff like that, absolutely. I mean, like um, JRPGs, like Final Fantasy VII, VIII, IX, et cetera, et cetera. I played through six as well at some point afterwards. And, um, you know, things like that. I mean, look, I mean, Half-Life, right? Half huge Half-Life is like, just, just, you know, come on, like, that's a, Great goddamn game. Uh, you know, I mean, what else, what else like, was really, really good from, from the past? I mean, I'm trying to think, like, okay. Um, like, LAN, I, I was a big LANer, um, so we played a lot of LAN games. Um, Total Annihilation <laughs> was, like, a big game. It lands, things like that. I mean, yeah, there are all, all sorts of stuff, right? I mean, like, like you, you, any, any kind of bigger game, 
I probably played it like it was big, um, and a lot of small ones as well. Um, so yeah, like lots of stuff growing up, absolutely. Um, anything good that you can name, I probably played it. So uh, yeah, any other questions yeah, in the room? Just one more question. Yep, over there. Um, so how long is it? How long do you think it should be for a new hire to introduce to the community, like from a programmer or um, maybe from a level designer or something like that? Um, so the question is, how long does it take for um, new hires to get used to our engine? Um, the answer to that is, yeah, it really depends on the discipline. Um, so if you are a programmer, um, a lot of the when we hire new programmers, typically um, they're doing gameplay code. Um, so it isn't necessarily the case that um, the engine is a big factor in what they're doing um, because it is gameplay code, um, which is custom in every game. Uh, and the answer for gameplay is freaking ages because um, we've got like 10 years of code there and like we're an action RPG with like literally like 15,000 stats um, like, and like so many items and everything, right? Like you change anything and it affects like 50 other things. Um, so yeah, it takes a goddamn long time to train new gameplay programmers for, um, to be to be hires just because of all of that history. Um, but that being said, I mean, look, you can be useful right away. Like we just sort of train like, here's how you make a skill for a monster, and then you can kind of do that. Like for, you know, you can make like monster skills kind of without like affecting the entire rest of the game so much. So like that is a thing where they will often get new gameplay programmers to do. Um, for artists, uh, once again, varies a lot depending on discipline. If um, if you're like an environment artist, it, like kind of doesn't really take that long because you're just kind of using Maya really. And like the only real thing you have to learn is like you know push the export button here and here's how to open the asset and out the engine things so you can see it. Um, like you know there's some material stuff, but it's kind of not like that different from other engines. You know like the like node based editors and stuff. Um, uh, for someone like an animator, um, you know once again it's like kind of mostly down to to the things like Maya. Um, probably the part that's like the most uh, high uh, difference in terms of training would be um, visual effects. Um, all the tools they're using are all custom and it's all kind of different and like they have to get used to all that stuff. Um, so that's probably the longest. Um, I honestly don't know how long it really takes to get like fully productive, but that's probably the, the hardest discipline, I guess. Um, level design as well, but then, okay, level design is just hard because like who out there, like how many, how many people out there who have like random level generation experience do you find who will come to New Zealand? Um, like very few. So kind of like all of those people are just like, have to be trained from scratch. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, like I don't know what other I mean, like anyone doing random level generation is using custom tools. There just uh, there isn't like a random level generation middleware you can use. Um, so yeah, like kind of just like that's just the nature of the game there. Um, so yeah, um, I guess that's my answer to that question. Um, so yeah, um, anyway, uh, that's uh, all the time we have, I guess. Yeah, so um, yeah, I guess that's all for today. Um, pizza's actually right up front right now. Thank you, Jonathan, for your talk. And no problem. Uh, Alright, oh, we're good. So yeah, we are. So, oh, thank you very much. much. Oh, I've got your mic right here. <laughs>